The major goals of our project are aimed towards investigating the role of host genotype on resilience to mountain pine beetle. And we have three main aims. We're working towards answering these questions in addressing resilience to mountain pine beetle using host genetics. And um, I'm just gonna read them here for you that we want to know, are there genomic signatures that distinguish pine in historic and novel mountain pine beetle habitats? We want to know if there are quantifiable differences between killed and surviving trees in that historic range during the mountain pine beetle hyper epidemic. And we also want to know if we can see any underlying genetic components that are related to attack susceptibility on that leading edge of mountain pine beetle range expansion. And two and three are addressing really similar issues, except for one is during, during the hyper epidemic where beetles behave differently than they do on the leading edge where you have a more endemic relationship with um, host choice and um, host seeking. So they're slightly different, but um, complementary. And today I'm gonna to start in the first is um, seeing if we can distinguish between historic and novel habitats using pine genomics. So there's a hypothesis that we've been testing for a long time as a community, seeing if pines that co-evolved with bark beetles are more resistant to colonization, colonization excuse me, than pines that are naive to bark beetles. And there's a lot of evidence in defense chemicals between species that this is true, that individuals that have a long relationship um, or individual species that have a long relationship with bark beetles have more defenses towards colonization than those that are completely naive to bark beetles um, in general and mountain pine beetles specifically. And even within a species, we can see differences in the defense chemicals between regions that are within what we call the historic range of mountain pine beetle versus those that are in a range that hasn't been historically colonized for a number of reasons, most of them being um, climate related. But how do we know exactly where these co-evolved individuals are? And historically, there's been evidence of um, red trees and we can use bark from fossils and look at different galleries that we see in old wood to try to help us date times when um, lot, like a long time ago, historic hundreds of years ago events happen. And then more recently, we can use um, the site data that we have um, on actual record. And we use this information along with climate variables to bound what we think the historic range is or historically suitable range is for mountain pine beetle. And on the right there, I have an image that's really probably familiar to most people showing which regions are extremely favorable in red towards mountain pine beetle um, presence and the ones that are not necessarily favorable historically to mountain pine beetles. So there's um, overwintering temperatures are super cold or something like that. And this is how we've been delineating the historic range of mountain pine beetles, pretty much climate and then that site data. And the models have gotten pretty good. In this more recent publication that Jordan and Allen um, put out, there's decent modeling of what's going on with mountain pine beetle and where we find them historically. And this um, range is supported and we find that there are differences between what happens with trees in that historic range as delineated by these climate variables and things that are outside that historic range. So there's defense compounds like terpenoids that are different and that difference is heritable. They find that there's more larva produced in naive hosts than in um, co-evolved regions or historic hosts. And both of these um, support that this climate modeling is doing a fairly decent job of telling us where the historic range of mountain pine beetle, pine beetle is, excuse me. But neither one of those um, are really looking at the underlying genetic or phenotypic resistance as part of the model. So what we set out to do is um, improve this with some genomic resources and add this component to the modeling and to do it, we needed range-wide sampling. And it's really easy to get climate data range-wide. I know why we've been modeling things this way. It's harder to get those phenotypic differences of um, 
defense chemicals on a range-wide basis. But now with genomic resources, we can start to identify some of those pathways and genes under chemical that are leading to those differences in chemicals and chemical expression um, for those defense compounds in the range-wide, um, all throughout Canadian logical range. So that's what we've set out to do. We sampled 634 individuals at 39 locations. And being genomic, we sampled a lot of markers, over 21,000. And I'm either going to call these markers or single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Um, that just means that there's a single difference in a region between two individuals, or more than two individuals. Um, so just so we're all on the same page with terminology there. And we sampled throughout the logical range in, in Canada. We don't actually have any samples in this data set from the US. We're looking to do that in the future. And then we had to phenotype these to see are there differences between that historic range and the novel range. Um, so we fell back on those same or similar, really, um, historic range estimates. And so in the pink here in the map on the right, you can see the area that we have bounded as historic for mountain pine beetle range. And this is based on climate and insight data. Oops. And then we created a gradient of, away from the mountain pine beetle historic range as our phenotype. So the closer to the range of those darker circles and purples and the farther away from the range you get, you get those oranges and yellows. So we use distance as a continuous variable in our phenotyping, and we also bend distance into discrete variables, relying heavily on Maya's work um, on flight distances to say that there's historic areas, there's areas within the short distance dispersal, and then there's these long distance flights. So we also um, did some bend phenotyping because we can do different statistical analyses on bend data than individual data, but they complement each other. So we use population and landscape genomic approaches to analyze these loci, these SNPs at, at all of these different individuals and sampling locations. And we were able to determine that there are definitely alleles associated with distance from the mountain pine beetle historic range. And then we use these to create an interpolation and mapped that back onto the landscape. So what I'm showing you here in this Venn diagram is a cross-validated result from separating out environmentally associated loci and individual and bend um, analyses to get the best set of loci to map back onto that landscape to see how those look. And so we ended up with 28 in total that were associated with the distance phenotype um, cross-validated loci. So here I'm showing you that um, the interpolation of those gene frequencies, we had to come up with a unique way of looking at the genotype and not just the allele on the landscape and doing this, which was um, a fun new adventure. We are, let me back up. So in, in black here, we have the shading of where the historic range is that we use to delineate our phenotypes and then our sampling points. And the frequencies, this genotype frequencies of outlier alleles just means that those are the genotypes that are either highly associated with the historic range or less highly associated with the historic range. And so we can use this genotype to say what is more closely resembling trees found in that historic range versus trees outside the historic range. So this map is informative um, in that way, and also is pretty complementary to what was happening with just looking at climate variables alone. So we think adding this into the model, these allele frequencies can help us delineate better which individuals might be in that co-evolved historic range versus outside, because gene flow in trees is really dynamic and widespread. And we're hoping that we can use this type of map and this layer in those models of historic range to inform our expectations on where to find stands that have co-evolved and therefore are more likely to survive outbreaks. And those are not co-evolved and they're more susceptible to mountain pine beetle. So even though in previous um, maps, we're showing that mountain pine beetle is 
and we all know we've seen it, perfectly capable of finding habitat within Alberta, these trees are more susceptible regardless of anything else because of their genotype. And so we knew that we, we didn't know, no, we had some expectation of that based on these phenotypes of defense chemicals, but we didn't necessarily know based on what the genotype of the trees are. And so this is a new result that we can use to complement those older historic maps. And then we can also use these to genotype an individual and say it's more similar to the historic range. And so this individual as a small seedling is more likely to be resistant. So this has definite applications to our stakeholders. So in addressing the question, are there genomic signatures that distinguish pine in historic and novel habitats? We can say, yes, there definitely are. Um, and there are definite applications to, to this in um, what I call the real world. <laughs> and so I'm going to move on to addressing if there are differences that we can find using those similar methods in that pipeline that we developed between killed and surviving trees in the historic range during the hyper epidemic in central BC. We know that survivors have um, significantly lower flow and resin and defense chemicals at the beginning and end of flight season. And um, there are reasons about beetle behavior that are related to this. And we know that the amount of defense compounds are heritable and there's a genetic component to what's going on with how these defense compounds are expressed in alive and, um, and individuals that have succumbed to mountain pine beetle attack. And we also know through study of neutral loci that there is a connection genetically to host survival of an outbreak. There's lots and lots of evidence that there's differences between survivors, but we haven't really pinpointed besides terpenoids and some defense compounds, what the underlying genomics and genetics of these um, compounds is. And so our goal was to look into this. Just to give a little bit more of an idea of how you investigate this type of thing, I wanted to give an overview of what the six um, study found. So Diana and her collaborators used a method called um, admixture to look at each individual tree, which is along the top. I've pointed to some bars. So each column is an individual and it's showing the proportion of a genotype. Um, for each individual from zero to 100% of a specific genotype. And they measured the standing genetic variation and then looked at just the variation and genotypes of the survivors uh, after an outbreak of mountain pine beetle in the stand. And what they found was that there was strong selection for survivor um, genotypes so that's a selection against that red genotype. If you see that shift between red and green and a little bit of blue to mostly green and blue in those two different data sets. And so there's strong selection towards specific genotypes and against others. And these use neutral markers. So we're not completely sure what the underlying drivers of this selection are. We don't know what genes they directly relate to. Um, but potentially they could be defense related genes. Well, maybe we'll find out soon, um, foreshadowing. So here I'm gonna show a study that was done out of Dezine Huber's lab. And this is more of a top down approach, whereas uh, the sixth study was more of a bottom up approach. And so this top down approach, we're looking at phenotypes and they investigated gene products, um, classically defense chemicals. And we know that the product varies between these different phenotypes, but not the underlying genotypes. And we took advantage of this data set. So I'm gonna go into it a little bit more and explain um, more about what this study was about. So because lodgepole pine holds their cones for more than one season, at the peak of epidemic, when there was patchy distributions of resistant and non-resistant trees on the landscape, cones were collected and um, these cones came from either trees that were dead, and so there's cones collected there, and then there were um, some trees that were alive, and they collected the older cones, so those cones that were pollinated previous, and then the young cones that were pollinated after um, the mountain pine beetle attack came through. 
And so this gives us kind of a temporal time stamp of what's going on in this stand as it's happening. So these cones were collected and seeds were germinated and grown. And um, they did some analyses on induced defense mechanisms. But even in the controls before the uh, experiment was run, you can see, and I've circled in pink here, that the phenotypes of those different cones strongly cluster. And that suggests to us that there's definitely a genetic component of what's going on in this stand. And we can then look at and use and take advantage of these individuals, these progeny collected to understand the underlying genetics of this resistance. So um, what we've done is use the extremes. We've just used the dead and the young, or what I'm gonna call alive, individuals as phenotypes. So these seedlings are progeny of mountain pine beetle casualties or survivors, and they represent those extremes. And this is really perfect setup for use in determining these underlying genetic differences related to lodgepole pine surviving or succumbing to attack and directly addresses resilience um, genetically. So we were lucky to be able to partner with Dezine and Staffin and take advantage of these um, trees that they collected and took care of. Um, we ended up with 481 individuals sampled from four locations. We had just over 14,000 genetic loci that we looked at. And um, as I said, we simplified the analysis by using only those extreme phenotypes. And then we ran quantitative and population genetics methods on these to look at that underlying genetic component. If you're super curious about methods, we can talk about it during the Q&A or um, you can shoot me an email and we can we can talk about it. Um, they didn't seem appropriate for today to go into detail on those. So here on the right, I'm showing the sampling locations. You can see that they're all fairly tight there in central BC. They're all located within what we would call the historic range for mountain pine beetle. And using that quantitative genomics approach, we found that that phenotype of dead or alive was really highly heritable, um, 0.4. So along with the same amount of heritability that was found for the chemical defenses. So that was good. That um, corroborates what was found previously for this population. And we found that um, our genomic selection methods were really highly predictive of survival. And what this means is that we can then predict survival based on genotype. So if we genotype an individual, and we add it to this matrix and we run the genomic selection, we can then predict whether or not that individual is likely to survive mountain pine beetle attack or not. This is a, a really, I think, strong result and fantastic to know about these data. Um, but that only tells us about the whole genotype of an individual. It doesn't delve down into what genes and what's important in the underlying um, markers. So we looked at some population genomics methods, and what we found was that we can see a reduction in standing genetic variation after a mountain pine beetle colonization. This is really similar to what Diana and her group found in their study on neutral genetic markers. And we did further analysis to see that the shifts in minor allele frequency support significant recent bottlenecks. But this isn't true for every stand. It's only true for specific stands. So some stands are having, there's more of an impact in some stands than others for this reduction of standing genetic variation. So what we found here, and what I'm showing in the graphs on the right, what you wanna pay attention to is differences between the orange and green bars. So at the carp-like location, there is no significant difference in allele frequencies between our two phenotypes, survivors or those that succumbed to mountain pine beetle attack. But if you look at McKinsey and McBride, you can see that there's large differences between the, the dead and alive phenotype. And there's a shift between minor allele frequency, so that's the allele that shows up less often in the two um, nucleotide pair that makes up a SNP. So that minor allele frequency is lower in the alive individuals than it is in the dead individuals. But then that flips and you have a shift into loss of minor allele frequency being higher 
in the alive individuals than the dead individuals. And what this tells us is that, whoops, that there's strong selection within those surviving individuals, but we're seeing a loss of genetic variation and therefore a loss of adaptive potential. So we're seeing a bottleneck of selection towards survival and pressures faced with mountain pine beetle and its symbionts. But what we're also seeing is a loss of adaptive potential. So if there are secondary bark beetles or other types of pests or pathogens that are coming through, we might be losing some of that resistance that we need to other, um, other things. So that's something to, to keep in mind as part of this type of selection. We also look to see what those specific markers were that were under selection using different population genetics approaches. And these markers are related to a large pole pine either surviving or succumbing. And we're looking at 49 markers that are linked to genotype um, to try to link those genotypes to um, phenotypes or gene products. So I've done an approach where I have used um, GWAS and um, genomic selection methods to identify loci that could potentially be important, and then a few different population genetics methods, and then controlled for environment, because we don't want to select for trees that have local adaptation. We want to select for trees that are actually responding to the phenotype that we're measuring. And so that's why this environmental loop is in here. And we're really focusing on the 49 loci that were identified um, and cross-validated through population genetics and quantitative, quantitative genetics methods. And we are still investigating those. We're not 100% sure what those phenotypes are to those products. Stay tuned. Um, that's actually the hard part of all of this and why it's not quite done yet. But we can say that there are quantifiable genetic differences between killed and surviving trees during the hyperepidemic, we're sure. Let me check the time here, okay. Um, so our third goal um, is answering the question about whether or not there's an underlying genetic component related to attack susceptibility on the leading edge of expansion. So these individuals can be either in the historic or the naive range, and they are in a different area of um, beetle pressure. So there's not hyperepidemic beetle behavior. It's more like an endemic beetle behavior in this expansion. So the short answer, because I want to make sure we have lots of time for, for questions and to discuss the project, is that yes, there is. However, we're just really beginning to understand the underlying genetics of this type of resistance at this level of pressure. And earlier in the year, I guess it's last year now, um, Kathy and I and Genesis Lab uh, published two loci that were under selection in this region and did some mapping to show those. But what we really want to do is get away from a single locus approach like this and move on to a whole genotype approach, which, which has caused us to need to invent the wheel, basically. No one's done this before. And so we're trying to come up with solid statistics and methodology to use genotypes on the landscape. So I've used a similar sampling strategy as that paper that um, we published early last year. And we have about 300 individuals from 16 locations, about 20,000 loci. And these are paired samples of attacked and unattacked nearest neighbors at the same DBH. So we're trying to control for age or preference of size um, for the trees in, in going through these paired sampling um, individuals. And so we've compared them in similar methods to what I've described before. And we identified 26 candidate markers that are associated with attack status. And these are also independent of environmental associations. So we're investigating further how we can then use those 26 loci and the loci that we identified in the central BC hyper epidemic area to compare to make up a genotype of survival. Like what did surviving trees look like? And then we can extrapolate from that what they look like on the landscape and do some surfaces like we did for predicting co-evolved loci in the mapping. So that's where we're, where we're going with that. But what we can say is that sure, yes, absolutely. There are differences in those genetic components of susceptibility to attack on the leading edge. So like I said, we're trying to develop some methodology and some statistics to map these onto the, la the landscape. 
And these candidate markers are being investigated for allele frequencies within the hybrid zone and into Jack Pine to assess some spread risk, but we want to do it at the genotype level again. And so that's taking a little bit of, of time and thinking. If anybody has any suggestions, I am happy to hear them. Um, and we're doing additional work to identify genes that are associated with these markers and the underlying physiology by looking at where those SNPs are in the transcriptome resources that we have and looking at some differential expression. And that is promising, but um, I didn't want to overwhelm everyone by presenting that as well today. So I'll save that for the next time we all talk. But really your take home, I think, from today is that there are some newly identified candidate markers. And collectively, as a genotype, these are going to be what our signatures are of high or low mountain pine beetle resistance that we can use to then test progeny or seed lots or um, anything for these types of these genotypes to try to predict whether or not they're going to be resilient to mountain pine beetle. And um, with that, I'm going to take any questions, I guess. <laughs>